Hey everybody, and welcome to a video on justifying probability theory. I want to first recap where we're at in this course. Well, since week one, we've been in search of a scientific inductive logic, that is a rigorous theory that would enable us to assess the inductive strength of arguments in a manner analogous to how deductive logic helps us to assess the deductive validity of arguments. Moreover, we want this theory to accord with some basic common sense and with scientific practice. We saw back in week two that developing and rationally justifying such a system would be no easy task given the difficulties posed by the old and new problems of induction. We're now at a point in this course where we've tried to develop mathematical probability theory as a candidate for being scientific inductive logic, and we can now assess whether it's a good candidate. In these next lectures before our course ends, I'm going to explore two questions. First, whether we can rationally justify the use of probability theory. And secondly, I want to ask to what extent does probability theory give us what we wanted out of a scientific inductive logic? Okay, in this first video though, we're going to focus on the first question of whether we can rationally justify probability theory. And then next week, we're going to look at to what extent uh, probability theory gives us what we wanted out of scientific inductive logic. All right, well, there's a number of approaches that philosophers have taken to justify probability theory. And we're just going to examine two of the most prominent ones. Uh, in this video, we'll look at Dutch book arguments. And then uh, in a video for Friday, we'll look at accuracy arguments. So two different approaches to justifying probability theory. Now, recall that we develop probability theory as an axiomatic theory. right? Uh, this means that the various probability principles that we've employed throughout this course, like the negation rule or the law of total probability or Bayes' theorem, are all logical consequences of a simple set of axioms that we laid out early on, right? Um, these axioms included the original three probability axioms we listed, which included right, normality, non-negativity, and additivity, as well as the ratio rule um, that we also introduced to connect conditional probability with unconditional probability. Now, one reason that this is so convenient to have this axiomatic setup is that now all we have to do to justify probability theory is justify the starting points, the axioms, right? And everything else follows from that as by deductive logic, right? As a logical consequence of it. In this video, we're just going to focus on justifying the three probability axioms, although similar arguments to what we'll go over in this video are available to defend the ratio rule um, and even some of the strictly diachronic principles we went over, like conditionalization or Jeffrey conditionalization. But the are more subtleties that come into play in those arguments. So we're just going to focus on the basic argument um, as it pertains to the three probability axioms of normality, non-negativity, and additivity. Okay. So what is the Dutch book approach? Well, a Dutch book argument tries to show that a certain patterns of, pattern of beliefs is irrational because it licenses senseless behavior. Right? So this is taken to be a, a reason for, to think of a certain belief set of beliefs as irrational, right? The rational beliefs don't license senseless behavior. And we'll see what we mean by senseless behavior is as we go on. So the general sort of form of a Dutch book argument, in particular a Dutch book argument for the probability axioms, is going to be something like this. Our credences or our, our levels of confidence in different propositions, right? Shouldn't license senseless behavior. That is, if our, our credences do license senseless behavior, then they're irrational, right? But, right, another premise, credences that violate the probability axioms license senseless behavior. Thus, credences that violate the probability axioms are irrational. Okay? So what we're going to look at is mostly this second premise of why, why think that credences which violate the probability axioms are going to license some senseless behavior. Well, what's going to be key to, to this argument, to Dutch book arguments in general, is that we're going to identify your probability or your credence for a proposition X with the fair price that you ascribe to a gamble that returns $1 on X and $0 on not X. So a gamble is just a, right, a bet that's that on a proposition X that's going to give you a dollar if X is true and nothing if X is false. Right? Um, now, the amount of money that, that you would be indifferent between getting that amount of money for sure and getting this a gamble, maybe a ticket that guarantees you this gamble, um, that's going to be your fair price for the gamble, right? And 
Intuitively, this should sort of align with what your probabilities are, right? Your fair prices for gambles of this form should sort of align with what your probabilities are, um, right? If you think that X is pretty likely, then you should have a higher fair price for X, right? You should be willing to pay more to, uh, excuse me, you should have a higher fair price for the gamble, right? You should be willing to pay more to get the gamble. Um, if you're, right, because that means you're probably going to get a dollar, right? If you think X is probably true. If you're more confident that X is false, right, then you think you're probably not going to get anything from the bet, for your, so your fair price for the bet should go down, right? Um, so if we assume this connection between your credences or your probabilities and your fair prices for gambles, uh, we can then offer a Dutch book argument for the probability axioms. Okay, and this is relatively easy to see for axioms one and two, right? That is for our normality and non-negativity axioms, right? Um, normality, remember, says that you have to assign probability one to any tautology, right? Um, in this setting, right, that would mean that our fair price for a bet that gives you a dollar if its tautology is true and nothing if it's false has to be set at one dollar, right? Um, but that seems exactly right, right? Because if you you don't you certainly want to pay you don't want to pay more than a dollar for any bet that could at most give you a dollar, right? That would be sort of senseless behavior, right? If say I, I set my my uh, fair price for a bet that gives me a dollar if its tautology is true, nothing otherwise. If I set that at two dollars, that would be crazy, right? Because then I'd be valuing it at two dollars when the most it could possibly give me would be one dollar, right? Um, but I also shouldn't set my uh, fair price for such a gamble at anything less than one because I know that tautologies are true, right? Um, we know that the tautology is guaranteed to be true, so that gamble is guaranteed to give you a dollar, right? Um, so the fair price for it should be set at a dollar, right? Similarly, if you think about the non-negativity axiom, right, um, you should never set your fair price for a gamble of this form at a negative number. Suppose I consider a gamble that gives me a dollar if x is true and nothing otherwise, and I value it at, uh, I don't know, negative two dollars or something, right? That doesn't make any sense as a fair price for this gamble, because the worst I could do, one could do with this gamble would be to get zero, so it shouldn't be valued at a negative number, right? So this sort of justifies, right, the thought that our probabilities, if we if we identify them with uh, fair prices for these bets, they should be numbers between zero and one, right? Um, and the tautology should get probability one, right, or fair price one. Right? Okay, so it's been fairly easy to justify those first two axioms, axioms one and two. The more difficult axiom to justify is axiom three, right? The additivity axiom. That's where a lot of the action is going on. So let's see how we could do that. Well, let's let's let R and S be mutually exclusive propositions, right? That's propositions whose conjunction is a contradiction, right? We want to show that the fair price for um, a bet on R or S should be the sum of your fair price for a bet on R and your fair price for a bet on S, right? That would that would be what the additivity axiom requires. So let's look at this setup here. So um, here I have uh, the in the columns I have the different uh, ways the world could be, right? So it might be that R, proposition R is true, or it might be that S is true, or it might be that neither of them is true. But those are different ways the world could be. And then here I'm using in the rows I'm using R, S, and R or S to represent different bets you could take, right? So right there's the bet on R, right? And the bet on R ends up giving you uh, $1 if R is true and nothing in the cases when R is false, right? Similarly, the bet on S ends up giving you 1 if S is true and nothing in the cases where S is false. R or S, right, gives you 1 in the R column and in the S column because in both of those columns R or S is true, but it gives you nothing otherwise, nothing if R or S is false, okay? So this is the basic setup. Now, right, Suppose I ask you for your fair prices on all of these uh, three gambles, R, S, and R, or S. And suppose you give me little r as your fair price for a gamble on proposition R. You offer me little s as your uh, fair price for a gamble on proposition S. And you offer me C as your fair price for a gamble on R or S. Now, let's suppose that C is not equal to R plus S, right? because that would be additivity if C equals R, R plus S. Let's suppose instead that C is let's say greater than r plus s, then we could run a similar argument if c were less than r plus s, right? Let's suppose c is, is greater than r plus s. You're willing, your fair price for r or s is greater than the sum of your fair price for r together with your fair price for s, 
right? And we're going to show this leads to a Dutch book, right? This leads to senseless behavior, right? If you set your fair prices in this way. Okay. Now, um, since R is your, little r is your fair price for a bet on the proposition R, you would be willing to sell that bet um, for uh, a price of R, right? And I have down here in the earns row, right, what's going to happen to you if, if you do that, right? So if you sell this bet on R, right, um, it means somebody's get paying you, right, your fair price R. So in each of these cases, you get R, you get payment from them, right? Um, but, right, if R is, turns out to be true, you also lose a dollar because you have to pay the, the person's winnings on um, R. So if R is true um, and you sell this bet, you end up getting R minus $1. Um, R is, of course, we've ordered R, it should be something less than 1, so this ends up being a negative number. Right? Um, and you get positive, right, R dollars on uh, if S is true or if neither R nor S is true. Okay? Now, um, suppose that um, you also sell uh, your, a gamble on S for your fair price at little s, right? Um, now, what does this end up giving you, right? Well, you've sold it, so you're going to get S. You're going to get the, the price of the gamble in each of these um, cases. Um, but in the case when S is true, you're also going to have to pay out, right? You're going to have to pay whoever bought the gamble from you. So that's going to cost you $1, right, to pay that out. So then the combined effect of selling the bet on R and selling the bet on S are given down here in this earns uh, row again. Okay. Now suppose, right, that um, you buy the, the uh, ga a gamble on R or S for your pair, fair price of C, which you're willing to do because that's C is, your, is given as your fair price, right? So what that means, right, since you're buying it, you're losing um, C, right, a cost of C in every um, case, whether R or S is true, whether R is true or S is true or neither of them is true. You lose C, but you do get $1 back um, if either R or S is true, right, because the gamble R or S will pay you a dollar in, in each of those cases, right? So if we look at the combined effects of all three of these um, bets you're taking, selling the first two, selling a bet on R and a bet on S, and buying a bet on R or S, each at your fair price. For doing so, we see that these are your your earnings that you're going to get in each case. Now, we can simplify what's here, right? So in each of these two cases, right, we have a minus one and a one here and a minus one and a one here. So we can do some simplification and see that these actually reduce to you getting the same uh, payoff uh, no matter what the sale of is, whether R is true or S is true or neither of them is true. Either way, once you've made these three transactions, your final payoff is going to be R plus S minus C, right? Um, but, oh, we had assumed that C was greater than R plus S, right? So in each of these cases, since C is greater than R plus S, this is going to be a negative number. So you earn a negative number no matter how the world turns out, which means you've been subjected to sure loss, right? You're going to lose money from taking these three transactions. So here, right, then we have a Dutch book, right? We have a case where each of these bets individually you judge to be fair, um, and yet when you take them all collectively, you suffer sure loss. And we could have run a similar argument if we had assumed instead that C was less than R plus S. Then we would have just changed things to make, instead of selling the first two and buying the last, we would have had you buy the first two bets and sell the last bet. And then um, it's, it's easy to see that you would have gotten a Dutch book in that case as well. So anytime when C does not equal R plus S, anytime when you violate the additivity axiom, we're going to be able to make a Dutch book against you. Okay, now does this support probabilism? Well, one worry might be maybe Dutch books are always unavoidable. Maybe even if your credences satisfy the probability axioms, you still can't avoid a Dutch book, and so this hasn't provided a real strong argument for the probability axioms. Um, fortunately, that turns out not to be the case, right? Um, we can show what's called a converse Dutch book theorem uh, that shows that if you satisfy the probability axioms, then the sort of Dutch book that we've looked at um, in in these cases will never happen to you, right? Or ne will never be open to you. Um, so never be licensed by your credences, right? Um, so that's good, right? Then you won't you won't suffer these Dutch sorts of Dutch books if you satisfy the probability axioms. But if you don't satisfy them, 
then you're always open to them, right? So this does seem to provide that uh, argument for having your credences satisfy the probability axiom, right? If they do, um, then you won't license this sort of crazy behavior. But if they don't, then you will. They, your credences will license uh, this sort of senseless behavior, where you'll lead to uh, losing money no matter how the world is like. All right, so this provides one very classic uh, attempt to justify the probability axioms, why we should think that the probability axioms should hold. Now, it did assume, right, that uh, your probabilities in a proposition coincide with your fair prices on these bets that we set up, right? And that's a substantive assumption. Um, we also assumed, right, a sort of uh, what's called packaging principle, right, where we assumed that, right, you'd be willing, once right, you set your fair prices, you're willing to take any number of bets on those, each on those fair prices. And that's a, that, that's an assumption too, right? Um, and there's a big literature on how defensible exactly those assumptions are. Um, but hopefully this at least provides some prima facie reason for uh, the probability axioms in your mind. Um, we're going to look at another alternate route that doesn't make exactly those assumptions uh, on Friday to justify the probability axioms, and that'll be to use accuracy arguments. So it'll involve using the Breyer score that we discussed uh, back in the week on forecasting. So we'll look forward to that. Uh, please remember to complete the participation poll for this video, and I'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot.